first of all, thank you so much for joining us um, for what is our last session that Goodwin is putting on in the three-part legal series. Uh, for those of you that joined yesterday's session on litigation and regulatory avoidance for startups with our colleagues, Grant, Jen, and Dave, um, they mentioned our session today would dive deeper into the employment and IP protection issues that your business should think about from its inception. Um, just before we begin, uh, this is a general presentation about areas of law that are rapidly changing and issues that change pretty quickly. Um, it should not be construed as legal advice because we are not considering the facts of your specific situation or any person's specific situation. If you have a particular situation or issue on which you need advice, uh, please feel free to reach out to your Goodwin contacts or to any of the panelists. Um, because there are so very many of you, and to help in management of the event, we have intentionally disabled the video and audio features for non-presenters and panelists. So uh, we do, however, want this to be interactive. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature to present your questions to us during the presentation. And also, finally, please note that we're recording this session and it will be made available following the program. And so I think we have some slides. We can get those up. Um, so first, we want to kick this off by kind of setting the stage a little bit and defining what we're talking about here. Um, so what are trade secrets and confidential information? So what are we trying to protect? So trade secrets can be any, quote, forms and types of financial, business, scientific, technical, economic, or engineering information that meets the following limitations. The first is that it has independent economic value because it is not generally known or ascertainable. Um, in language that's a little bit easier to understand, that means that a trade secret is valuable because it's not known by the general public. And it's not something that the general public can readily see. And so kind of the classical examples of something like this that you often hear talked about in terms of trade secrets are things like the form of the formula for Coca-Cola and um, the 11 herbs and spices and whatever other addictive chemicals that go into Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, but as we'll talk about, trade secrets are actually considerably broader than that because it also includes things that are information about your finances, um, your business and how you conduct your business, um, things like customer lists, uh, things like um, contact information in some circumstances, all could be trade secrets because they may have independent economic value because it's not known by everybody else. Second element is that a trade secret is subject to reasonable measures to maintain secrecy. That doesn't necessarily, and, and so that's, you know, the reasonable part is something that we'll talk about a lot today. Um, it's not the case that they necessarily have to be locked up in a vault that is accessible by only one person at all times, but they have to be subject to reasonable measures. Like the more valuable it is, you know, the closer that it's kept within the company. Um, notably in trade secrets, there's no requirement of any absolute novelty or orig originality. It doesn't have to be the case that this is not known to anybody in the world, but it has to be not generally known or ascertainable. And for trade secrets, there's also no requirement that a company or anybody get a grant or registration through any agency of a government. So your trade secrets are your trade secrets. Uh, they're held close within the company. Um, and one thing we'll talk about today and why it's so important to protect trade secrets is that trade secret protection is very fragile. Um, it can last a very long time. For example, if we go back to that formula for Coca-Cola that I have that I mentioned earlier, that's been around for decades, if not the better part of a century, and it's still technically a trade secret. But once it's out there, once it's known by the general public, uh, your trade secret protection is essentially gone. And so the other thing that we'll be talking about today is confidential information. And so this is a category that is broader than trade secrets. And it is of course also the case that these two overlap. Um, but confidential information is 
basically the information that you don't want the rest of the world to know. Um, so things that are subject to confidentiality restrictions, either by agreement, um, something that you mark confidential, and again, things like customer lists, uh, formulas, algorithms, supply chain information, uh, basically anything that you use to conduct your business that you don't want the rest of the world to know about. And so we'll go to Karai talking about considerations with employee intake. Sure, thanks, Rachel. So we have structured this kind of in along the lines of the lifetime of an employee relationship. So we'll talk about intake later on. We'll talk about as the employee departs, how do you protect your trade secrets there? But the question here is, how do you protect yourself from claims by another company when you bring on someone on board? Some of the considerations you have are, uh, you know, having, knowing what obligations those employees have when they come in. Are they locked up to a non-compete in a state that allows non-competes? What are the limitations around that? Are they restricted from servicing certain customers? Perhaps you've hired them to do those very things such that this person will no longer be usable to you. Um, so you want to know what are their limitations, but then you also want to know that when they come in, they understand what your expectations of them are. And typically those are wrapped up in a proprietary information and inventions assignment agreement that you would have and all new employees sign. So that contains, that agreement contains a lot of things. One is um, you are having them agree at, you know, at the inception of their employment relationship that they will maintain the confidentiality of everything they learn while they're an insider with your company. Another piece of it is, is that they're signing over saying, I understand that everything I work on while I'm uh, at this company and I develop and invent is yours employer, not mine, because you're paying me to do so. And then another piece of it is also and this is a nice piece for when Rachel and I have to defend a company um, is a provision that says, look, we as your new employer expect you to, ab to abide by all of your contractual relationships and obligations with your prior employers. So we do not want you breaching. We did not hire you to, to come spill the beans on what your previous uh, employer was doing. In fact, we expect you to maintain the, co the confidentiality of that and to maintain your obligations. Um, and so you're making it very clear in writing in that agreement that no one should have any misunderstanding as to what your intentions are with them and that you do not want them to bring in any information. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's training. Sometimes, especially for sensitive uh, employee hires, you brought somebody in from a uh, competitive team or a competitor itself um, and sensitivity that you've either brought over a lot of people before or the two companies are just so competitive that bringing this person over will be scrutinized. And so you may want to have happen is having new hire training, um, you know, where you basically sit down on a one-on-one -on -one counseling session with the person and, um, you know, it's, it's it relay your expectations about their maintaining the confidentiality of their prior employer and to also quiz them. Do you have information from your prior, prior employer still with you? A lot of people think, oh, no, I don't have it. But then when you start asking the question of, well, do you have a Dropbox account? Do you have Google Docs? Do you have, you know, all types of areas where people may have squirreled away things just for convenience during their prior employment relationship? that they still may have access to those things. Evernote is another example. So, you know, what you would do is you, once you find out and they're like, oh, I, I don't know, I haven't checked, you would either have them look but not open those files uh, and come back to you saying, it looks like I do have some stuff from former employer. And then the assistance okay. To get rid of it. Um, um, so that no one could possibly say that after joining you, someone was accessing their information. Some companies go so far as to have an included in their first day presentations, training in terms of what expectations are about respecting prior employer confidentiality, but also 
what the new employer's expectations are with regard to safeguarding their own confidential information. So for example, some companies will be very strict about you are not permitted to forward things to your personal email account and then work on them um, from home at a home computer. Or if you're gonna print out documents, you need to make sure you bring them back to the company to be shredded, just put them in your recycling at home. Those types of things, and it'll all depend on you know how sensitive the company is about that information. As I mentioned, you know one part of the intake is to make sure people come in clean, particularly for uh, you know sensitive hires. You want to make sure people have really good hygiene, come in squeaky clean, so that when that inevitable letter is going to come in from a former employer saying you hired one of our people, I hope you know that they have contractual obligations. They're that other paragraph that is much more difficult to address that says, in fact, we have looked and have learned that they have retained information that in the days and weeks prior to departure, they forwarded a bunch of stuff to their personal accounts, or they inserted a, a portable drive and have downloaded you know, X gigs of, doc, of documents and materials. Um, that is something you as the new employer would want to know in advance and make sure that you know, you've taken steps so and either knowingly or unknowingly doesn't then bring all of that information into your company. For example, up, uh, uploading or syncing their Evernote account and suddenly all of that data is now re residing on your servers. It becomes very difficult to, to defend saying, no, we didn't use it if it's sitting on the computer systems of the new employer. Lastly, we'll just mention here for you know, aqua hires, that is M&A transactions where you're not really hiring or buying the company for you know, some great technology that they've developed yet or patents, but really it's that they've already assembled the team and the know-how and you're, you're hiring the capital. Be careful there that you really got up to proper agreements and that the uh, team is gonna come over understanding what the limitations or freedoms they have to relay the information they worked on as required. We can switch to the next slide. And so now I'll talk a little bit more about a topic that Karai just touched on in the last slide um, that, that needs to be considered when bringing in employees. And that is what we refer to as restrictive covenants and non-competes. And so in terms of what we're talking about, um, that is any agreement that prohibits an employee from working in a specific field or a specific geography for a certain amount of time after leaving your prior employer. And so with respect to non-competes, um, states in the US and different jurisdictions vary kind of widely on how they treat these. Um, basically in California and a few other states, um, a non-compete on an employee that has left a prior employer is illegal and it's void. It's basically no good and not enforceable except for under a few specific circumstances that we'll talk a little bit about. And so in California, non-competes are generally not enforceable. Um, and also note that California courts will usually be pretty strict on this when uh, somebody tries to assert that another state's law might govern in that instance. Um, there are quite a few twists on non-competes. Um, in most other states, um, non-competes are enforceable if they're reasonable as to time and scope. And so that's basically saying that if the amount of time that the person is basically sidelined and not allowed to work in a specific field is reasonable, and if the scope, um, that can be things like geography, especially for folks who are in sales and marketing, or it can be uh, like a specific field or area. If those are reasonable, then the courts in other states will generally enforce a non-compete. Um, in some instances, if you have a non-compete that's overbroad and you get into litigation, the court will basically rewrite the, the non-compete and basically either reduce the length, reduce the scope, things like that. Um, but that's not necessarily something that can be counted on. Um, and it's also important to note that some states, when you're talking about non-competes and restrictive covenants, um, a kind of more recent trend is to impose some kind of salary threshold 
on non-competes in deciding on whether or not they're going to be enforceable. Um, this is basically a reaction to companies like, I think, Subway, um, the sandwich makers were kind of getting in trouble for this, is uh, adding non-compete clauses to their contracts with their hourly employees who were sandwich artists. And so that obviously has a pretty pretty bad effect on somebody's ability to get employee or employment in their next job. And so a lot of states have cracked down on that recently. Um, one big exception in California and in a lot of places to the enforceability of a restrictive covenant is when you are selling a business. In that instance, a non-compete can pretty much always be enforced, even in California and in the other states. Um, there are a few caveats to this. Um, it basically has to be selling all of an, an individual's ownership interest. And it's best practice to not include the non-compete in the employment agreements and instead include them in a deal document to basically make those two worlds kind of separately, separate. Um, one other thing to note uh, when you're dealing with non-competes, uh, when you're onboarding employees, is that in California, if you are firing an employee, after a former employer threatens litigation over a non-compete that is not enforceable, um, that can open you up to liability because you cannot terminate that employee without potentially doing a wrongful termination in violation of public policy. So that's something to look out for. Um, if, at least in California, if somebody's former employee um, kind of starts litigation and threatens litigation, then it's something that you have to be careful with. Um, the other flavor that we see restrictive covenants come in is what's referred to as non-solicits. And so those are provisions that forbid or try to forbid somebody from soliciting either customers or employers or employees. Um, and so the first flavor is um, a customer non-solicitation covenant. And that is basically a provision that forbids you from soliciting customers of your former employer. Um, at least in California and a few other states, uh, those are not generally legal. Um, the other flavor that kind of comes into play here is employee non-solicitation covenants. Um, those are generally enforceable. Um, there's a trend kind of going against them. And so that means uh, that it's sort of a provision that forbids um, a former employee from going back to his employer and basically recruiting people over. And so this is something to be careful about because I, as a lot of people find when you're starting up, one of the best sources of new employees and new talent is the folks that your current employees used to work with or the folks that you used to work with. And so it's something to be very careful of and something to be aware of what kind of restrictions an individual may have as they're coming over. Um, there's some pretty simple ways around it. Um, basically not having that person participate in recruiting. And if that person gets approached, just have them refer somebody to HR recruiting or somebody else. Uh, so we've talked about um, employees generally, uh, you know, up to this point. And here we'll start, you know, diverging a little bit and not just talking about employees. Um, and so what security measures should you take or can you take to protect your trade secrets? Because if you'll recall, Rachel was saying that one of the critical things to be able to run to say, I have a trade secret that's been misappropriated, is the court's going to look at what measures have you taken to safeguard and keep that from the, from the public eye and to keep it secret. And so these are some of the things that you would, you'd, I would, in a, in a brief to a judge, list out that the company does um, in terms of reasonable steps to take and protect the, the trade secrets. One would be company issued device policies. So for example, if you are a company that uh, hands out uh, computers and 
handheld devices uh, to folks. What steps do you have with respect to requiring passwords on those devices, for example? Can they be capable of being remotely wiped? Um, does IT require VPN access? All of those types of things that you would expect to see in a kind of in a com in any sophisticated company with regard to protection of IP. Can a, a random stranger from the street grab this device and be able to access all of your crown jewels? Or are there various ways of safeguarding those devices? Additionally, um, you know, to the extent that you allow employees to use their own devices, iPhones, et cetera, and you allow them to put their work emails on that, what steps are you taking as the employer when they leave to make sure that those devices are wiped? Or do you have the right, for example, to inspect it to make sure that there is no uh, company information that continues to reside on there? Uh, also, in this day and age, remote work, everyone's doing it. Uh, and I think it probably would be much more common. And so we do not have the kind of uh, you know, safeguarded office with the badge access and, and, you know, clean rooms and all of those types of things that we may have had in the past. Instead, we've got people working at home. And as I mentioned before, you have to start thinking about things like people printing at home, people doing Zoom calls, uh, you know, with others, roommates, uh, spouses, et cetera, that are present overhearing confidential information that are not bound by any kind of NDA. Uh, it's such that, you know, no, no one's going to go and have those people signed up to an NDA, but perhaps for really sensitive meetings where you're discussing things like trade secrets, that, you know, the person has to be alone in a room with the door closed. Um, you know, there's, so there's a variety of kind of things to think about in the remote work environment um, where work is happening in an uncontrolled uh, space where you just really need to kind of think about what information is out there in areas where I cannot control and what steps am I going to take either at the end of the employment relationship or once everyone returns to the office about getting all of that back in. Uh, beyond that, you know, we mentioned uh, computer security issues, so phishing for trade secrets. Um, sometimes, you know, just like any other phishing attacks, um, you know, a lot of malware is delivered via email, you know, over 90% of it. Phishing attacks usually account for more than reported uh, security incidents. And, you know, typically it's something that looks authentic and says, can you send me this slide deck or can you send me this spreadsheet, et cetera. I am in a meeting right now, I need it. Um, and that you should have some steps to uh, verify the authenticity of unusual email addresses, uh, or requests like that where it should be okay from your corp company culture to actually say, can you give me a call? Uh, or, you know, something along those lines where you're actually trying to verify that it is indeed that person before the employee then forks over some very valuable information. Uh, lastly, with uh, third-party and non-disclosure agreements, as I said, we've talked about employees, but you also have vendors uh, either working with you where you are you know, turning over some of that information. Um, and you wanna make sure that you have all of those relationships tied up with NDAs. So you can sign PIIAs, but if you then ship over like some of your data for either quality testing or some other thing to a vendor, but don't actually have a contractual uh, provision in your contract with that vendor to safeguard the confidentiality of the agreement, you should expect your opponent in a trade secret case whoa, you've actually forked it over to your vendor who maybe they, out of, a, out of a sense of business obligation, might keep it confidential, but there's no requirement legally for them to do so. We'll consider this to be you sending it over to a member of the public, and at least that would be a grounds for them to argue that it's no longer a secret anymore. Let's move on to the next slide, Judy. Rachel, I think you're on mute. Um, and so a little bit more about non-disclosure agreements, um, as Karai mentioned, is that these are very necessary for pretty much whenever you have to work with and exchange information with somebody outside the company. Um, so folks like vendors, 
um, potential partners and investors, um, customers, anybody that you are working with, sharing information with, et cetera. Um, and I think one of the most important points um, kind of surrounding and backing up to non-disclosure agreements is to know who you're dealing with and to know what exactly they are going to be doing and what they're allowed to be doing with the information that you give them. And so that's kind of the first step in understanding, you know, who you're dealing with and, and kind of what's entailed in getting into a non-disclosure agreement. Um, other very important parts of getting the non-disclosure agreement together is an identification of what types of information will be shared. So if it's things like financial information, um, medical information, which has its whole other set of regulations, uh, trade secrets, customer information, and defining very clearly what is permissible to do with it and what kind of restrictions that the third party has when they're handling this information. Um, things like who they can share it with, um, how they have to treat it, whether or not they have to mark it confidential or they, they have to put some sort of header, footer, some sort of marking on it indicating where it's from and that it's confidential and generally what they're allowed to do with it. And so next slide. All right, so we talked about bringing in new employees. How about when they leave? This is, a, you know, a, a time where I hold down at the job. They think of exit interviews as just simply being, here's your cover information, it's your final paycheck, uh, did you like it here? Something along those lines. Uh, you know, when I speak to HR professionals, I tell them that they are one of the first lines of defense to the company's trade secret and confidential information. Um, and that is very true. That is, have an exit in interview um, for employees that is meaty, right? Like, find out where they're going. They're not obliged to tell you, but if they're hedgy um, or they tell you they're going to a competitor, that's a much more sensitive departure. And we can think about different things that you might do out of a sense of diligence to make sure that you've protected yourself. Um, can, you know, you're talking about the exit interviews and so you remind them of their obligations under the PIIA and you do that similar brainstorming exercise with them saying, hey, look, have you, you, here's, you've given us your badge and you've given us your laptop. Uh, do you have any other information of ours in, in your possession? No, I don't. Did you check your home office? Did you check your home computer? Did you check your personal email accounts? Did you check your personal Dropbox and other cloud device, uh, accounts? And so you basically brainstorm through with that employee where they're like, oh, I checked that. So on their final day, they're still continuing to try to find that information. And so you make sure that you've been very thorough because employees are unlikely to be thorough on their way out the door. They're thinking about their next gig and saying goodbye to all their former coworkers. Um, so you also want to, um, you know, in some states you can ask to interview the uh, exit interview or sorry, record it, depending on the state, whether it's legal or not, you know. Uh, you, I would say in most, you know, day-to-day -day exit interviews, it would be pretty surprising uh, for people to be recorded on their exit interview, but it might be an option. Um, you know, if it's a sensitive departure, the person's going to a competitor or they just up and left in the middle of the night or you think they took a bunch of stuff and they're not, re not returning the laptop, et cetera. Then, then you start, start looking into, in. let's do some forensics. Let's look at the electronic activity around the time of departure. Have your IT department look at what emails have they sent? Did they download significant num you know, size uh, files uh, to an external device of some kind? So when you start seeing suspicious or an employee accessing areas and files that they just either don't have a reason to access or shouldn't have accessed in a long time, then you've got cause for concern. And you may be sending a follow-up email to that employee saying, reminding you of your obligations. And oh, by the way, we think we smell some smoke here. Um, here's some things that we found to be concerning. Explain yourself. If we don't hear back from you in a week or so, you know, we're going to take things further potentially. 
And so you really have to kind of be a little stern and not be sloppy or lazy about trying to protect and run down those potential areas where you think some of your trade secrets potential information may have left the barn. Certainly take steps to disable access to accounts. I have run into situations where employees after their departure have continued to access, for example, Salesforce. And we, the company starts squawking saying, what are they doing taking, you know, going into Salesforce and accessing information? They've already started it the new employer, which is a competitor of ours. And I say, look, I'll send that letter. I think that, you know, that, that's right. I think their new employer would also be pretty concerned that they're doing that. But what are you doing? Like, it's going to look very, very bad to a judge that you have not steps to disable their access to some of the most important things, your CRM. So, you know, it is incumbent on the company to make sure that those accesses are, are terminated on the final day. Um, again, I mentioned the com computer and phone to the extent that they have things on their personal devices. You may think about saying, you need to wipe your iPhone, or we'd like to, to confirm that, you know, the exchange server for your Outlook, et cetera, has been disabled and, and all of those emails that are cached on your phone are now gone. Um, and uh, to the extent that the employee, um, you know, is either hedgy about returning stuff or won't tell you who the new employer is, uh, you should continue to monitor their, their conduct following their departure. So, you know, you think it was a suspicious departure, have someone in HR or someone on your team um, periodically check on LinkedIn, where did they go? They never told you before, but now you're seeing they're showing up for, you know, working for a stealth startup and they won't even tell you what it is. There's reason for concern there, um, such that you may want to get assistance of counsel to send a scary letter saying, tell us what you're up to. And if you don't tell us what you're up to, at least tell us that you understand your contractual obligations and you intend to live up to them. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. Rachel, I think you're on mute again. No, I'm no longer on mute. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> as I were, uh, this slide gives us a little bit more information on what to do about investigating a possible misuse of trade secrets or confidential information. So basically what to do when you've gone through your HR procedures when an employee is leaving and you suspect that something has happened or something has been taken or that there's been some kind of breach. And so this is basically talking about ways of establishing a set protocol for identifying, reporting, and addressing any breaches and inadvertent disclosures. So basically you set up the places that you want to look for this in what is suspicious activity or information and what the next steps are. And so an investigation can include um, a forensic examination of the electronic devices and computer systems. And so these are basically investigations that are targeted at discovering kind of the potentially suspicious activity that Karai was mentioning with the next slide. Things like mass downloads that are not characteristic of how that person uses the systems, um, lots of transfers to things like thumb drives or drop boxes or any other cloud storage, um, deletions um, that are out of the ordinary, things like that. And so basically in a forensic examination, we bring in a vendor who can just look at those systems and look at those servers and devices and give some kind of idea of what happened and what a person was doing. Um, with respect to forensic examination of electronic devices, uh, the important thing there is that if you are suspicious that anything happened with a departing employee, and you gave that employee, um, for example, a company phone or a company laptop, just preserve that device. Just make sure you hold on to it. Um, don't do anything until you get it to the forensic examiner. Just leave it as is, um, because that is one common way that cases can go awry is that somebody was using their company laptop, um, downloading a lot of stuff, uh, transferring files, things like that but 
the company did not preserve the laptop, and so that evidence is basically gone. Um, also, investigations um, kind of for servers and larger systems, it entails an evaluation of what kind of access that person was doing, what they were doing with, for example, um, the classic example that we see a lot that Karai mentioned is Salesforce. Is that person going into places where they normally wouldn't be going? Are they downloading things that they normally wouldn't be supposed to download or look at or necessarily need for their job and things like that. And then also, um, as Karai mentioned a little bit, witness and exit interviews. Um, the exit interviews we talked a little bit about previously. And then witness interviews, um, that can be things like talking to people that were the leaving employees' colleagues, um, anybody that they worked with on that front, and anybody who would have kind of understood what their role was and kind of what they were doing toward the end. And also monitoring and surveillance, kind of as Karai mentioned as well, with you know looking to see if there's any continued access. Um, if there is, making sure that that's cut off as soon as possible, and figuring out where the employee is going and what their next plan is. Um, kind of lastly, in terms of investigating a possible misuse of trade secrets, um, acting quickly is very important. Um, the longer that you wait, if you suspect something, uh, the harder it is to be able to go into court and say that you were acting reasonably when you're protecting your trade secrets or confidential information. And so acting quickly, um, that includes getting the investigation going in the near term, um, contacting counsel when you suspect something's happened, and then following up with uh, what we refer to as a cease and desist letter to the employee, basically explaining what they, you know, what happened and, you know, kind of asking them to either return the information, explain what they did, et cetera. So when, you know, after everything that Rachel just talked about, litigation becomes likely or actually ensues, what does that look like? On, on the left side here of the slide, we talk about if you are the company who's had their trade secrets taken, what do you do? And on the right side, it is what you would do if you are on the receiving end of a very scary legal letter saying we're about to sue you for misappropriation of trade secrets. Uh, or you so uh, potential claims, trade secret misappropriation, uh, both federal and state uh, versions of that. Uh, and so again, what you're gonna be obliged to do is to show that you've got a, you know, a bit of information that has economic value because it is secret in nature that you've taken to protect it. Uh, and you assert that both against the, in the employment context, the person who took the information and disclosed it, and also the recipient of that information, who's we assume to use it, is it a former employee and their new employer that would be sued for misappropriation because both are utilizing your trade secrets. You may make a strategic decision not to pick a fight with, say, for example, a really big company that that former employee went to um, because they've got deep pockets and can afford, you know, a really robust. Uh, lead. Uh, it, it, those are strategic decisions to make, but that's a, the, the primary claim. That is a very serious claim to bring. You need to really kind of have, you know, a, a, a lot of smoke, if not actually see the fire before you bring a claim like that. And that's because there's some consequences for bringing an unfounded claim turn back and be put on you for not having a, a strong basis for bringing that claim. The other thing that companies should be well aware of is don't throw that misappropriation claim around or allow your legal team to, to bring that claim for you unless you understand the consequences of it. Many courts and many jurisdictions will expect you to have at the very beginning of the case to identify the trade secrets that are at issue. And that doesn't mean talking about things generally. It might mean that you have to disclose in a protected way the actual lines of code or the actual secret sauce recipe that Rachel to your opponent's counsel. Now it might be shielded from your opponent 
the other of the company, but their law firm is entitled to see what exactly are you saying is, is trade secret so that we can litigate about this effectively. And so some companies may say, I cannot afford to do that you know, it, it, that's too risky for me, such that you may assume or decide not to bring a trade secret claim. Additionally, besides the trade secret claim, a breach of the a confidentiality agreement um, against the employee that left and who, who had an obligation to maintain the confidentiality, and you would turn around and, and bring a tortious interference with contractual relations claim against the new employer. You knew that I had a contractual relationship with my employee and when you hired them over, you encouraged them to breach their confidentiality obligations and have enjoyed the benefits of that. Um, an employee who has been secretly, while they're still wearing the employee cap working for you, has been secretly working for a competitor or setting up a competitive business and working on it substantively, uh, or has been forwarding things and acting disloyal, um, could potentially find themselves on the hook for a, a, a breach of duty of loyalty claim. And typically what you would be seeking there is make them cough up all the benefits and compensation they receive for the period of time that they were not a loyal employee. I want to keep, do one little asterisk here to the extent you have an employee leave and go and form their own company and sign a lease and get, you know, letterhead printed up and come up with what their logo is and maybe even do some introductory meetings with, with investors. But it's the actual work on a, a competitive product that would be disloyal. So don't knee-jerk react as soon as somebody su even suggests that they might go out on their own, that somehow they become disloyal. It will be a judgment call in terms of how far have they gotten or are they just merely engaging in formation activities. Uh, and lastly, unfair competition laws uh, of any jurisdiction typically will protect saying, look, you're not allowed to use unlawful means in order to secure a business. Typically that is geared towards the new employer who has enjoyed the benefits of the torts that have been committed against you in a way that's giving them either a, a business advantage or giving them a head start where they normally would not have gotten as far as they would have if they hadn't had the benefit of your information. In response, if you are the company who has brought on an employee and either knowingly or unknowingly, they, there's been problems as a result of that. The worst thing you can do is try to start covering things up or uh, trying to delete things or trying to fire things. You need what the idea is with the assistance of counsels to make sure that you look diligent and innocent. Um, so preserving all devices and accounts for subject employees. To simply say, you need to delete that to employees or wiping their computers or wiping devices that they have. Potentially, you would have, as after receiving a letter like that, is, is what's called spoliation. The other side can say, look, there was relevant information there. I have no way of knowing what that was. And judge, you should assume that it was, a, it was information that was helpful to me and harmful to them. That's really not great when you're on the defense side. Additionally, um, you know, you may wipe that computer or device, but it, there's actually things that put things into context or, you know, there's date stamps on there or there's metadata showing that the information was actually not accessed uh, after they joined you. Things like that that might be actually vind vindicate you from any kind of wrongdoing. So you're looking at, you know, preserving computers, physical accounts, you know, email accounts, et cetera. To the extent an employee coughs at, after receiving a letter like this, and it, it's pretty bad, they say, I've got stuff. Bring in your counsel. Your counsel is probably going to take those devices and not even have them stored, stored in your, you know, company's uh, premises. Um, so that we can say it was out of the hands of anybody who might be interested. You'd also institute a litigation hold with the assistance of counsel, which basically sends an, a memo out to everybody saying, look, we've been put on notice that there's this claim to preserve all information. And that will be very helpful so that the other side can't say you did not preserve pursuant to your obligations. Um, and again, and retain counsel, obviously, as soon as possible. Look, there, in the, especially in the tech world, there are a lot of what we call nasty grams back and forth. You know, they vary in degree. Uh, some of them are simply 
want to remind you, employee or new employer of employee, this person has obligations. And there are others that are more serious that say, look, not only that, but we've looked into things and something is, is, is concerning here. You, you hired four of our people and we suspect that there's been solicitation. Or there may be something like, we're about to file a lawsuit. Depending on the degree and the scariness of that letter, you need to think of how quickly you're going to get an attorney involved. But you know, these are not issues that you should try to muddle through on the defense side on your own or pick up the phone and call the CEO. I'll fire the guy. I didn't know he was such a bad actor. You might be admitting something along the lines of, I received your information such that your product that you're developing may be tainted. And two years from now, they'll come back to you saying, we want a share of the royalties of that product because you've admitted in the past that you had our information and this, what you released is remarkably similar to what we have. So we'll wrap up there. I think there are some uh, questions, um, hopefully, from the group that Rachel and I can field. We sure are. Thank you both. Um, we have got some like kind of specific questions, but hopefully they're helpful in a broader context. Um, how does someone make sure that new hires come in clean? There could be times when employees may not fully remember if they actually worked on some technology in the previous company or in rare cases may not inform about them? Where does the liability lie in that case? So I think you wanna be careful about how much you're inquiring, right? Like even in interviews outside of this context, what did you work on? And you know, curiosity naturally takes over. Be careful that you're not basically pumping this information for them to disclose confidential information to you. But you know, the, the good hygiene practices at the inception of the employment relationship are, have them sign IA, which has them reattest. I agree. I will. I will follow my obligations with my prior employer, and I understand you don't want me to breach those obligations or bring in my old employer's information. The next is to sit down with them and say, "Look, this is a sensitive hire. We need to talk about what information obtained from other employer besides what's in your head." And you would just go through that exhaustive list of all the places that they may have retained information and then takes, you know, appropriate steps to say, okay, we need to get that back to your former employer or we need to delete it such that you're not bringing it into this new employer. Rachel, any notes on that or does that cover it? Um, yeah, I think that covers it. It's just important to make sure that you ask, ask the questions, remind the person of their obligations and you know, if you find something, then you contact counsel and take steps to remediate it. Yeah. Um, Melissa Carr wants to a non-compete from a Texas company signed in Florida, enforceable in California against a California company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is a great law school hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, the employee is in California, is that correct? I think so. And the, and the company is a California company, but the non-compete was from Texas, but signed in Florida. Um, so I would think probably not, because if you're in a California court, the California court will apply California law. Um, it might be a situation where uh, it's a good idea to kind of take action sooner rather than later on that. So you can be in that California court. Mm. Um, and Karai, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I mean, there's gonna be some some risk here, right? It, it, you know, the old employer will run to Texas court saying we wanna enforce an agreement against uh, somebody who worked for us in Florida, but the agreement's governed by Texas law. Both of those states allow non-competes. Uh, and either that employee will say to the Texas court in response or will, along with their new employer, file a lawsuit in California. And either of those venues will say, hey, I'm a California resident now. Um, you know, I am entitled to free mobility. I'm working for a California company. California public policy will not allow enforcement you have to include California public policy when you're evaluating whether or not to enforce this non-compete. Some states get it right. Some states will say, well, we have public policies too. And that's where, if it's really an important hire, you would have a lawsuit filed in California that said, because you know, California courts are going to seriously. Yeah. 
Yeah. And one thing that sometimes comes up in those kinds of scenarios is how long the person has been in California. Did they just move there? You know, do they spend all their time there? Things like that. And so that can be a complicating factor too. Sounds like Melissa should reach out to you guys to get some more clarity on this specific situation. Um, perfect. And another slightly specific question. If my prior employer got acquired and my prior direct report applied for a job that I posted because of the change, what is the best thing for me to do? So your prior, your prior employer, somebody basically somebody from your prior employer reaches out to you for a job. Yes. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to understand um, what kind of obligations you carried from your prior job. Um, did you have a non-compete? If you did, has enough time passed that that's that non-competes in effect? If the answer to those questions is yes, then there's nothing to worry about and you can talk to the person. If the answer to the, those questions is no, um, it becomes a little bit more complicated because um, employee non-solicits are usually enforceable, but not always. But probably the best thing to do is to refer that person to someone else within your company and just say, thanks, I'm going to let you talk to so-and-so and they can take it from there. Got it. Um, that kind of gives you you know, because the person that's seeking the job reached out to you, you know, that's that's the big thing. They can do that. You know, there's nothing contractually that forbids them from talking to people and including people they know in their network to get a job. Yeah. Um, but just kind of pass it off to the recruiting folks and, and then, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, Broderick wants to know, um, his company plans on having offices placed in major cities around the country, um, but they'll be based in Georgia. Would they need to have the employment language written based by the state that the office is in, like state by state or just where they're headquartered? So it's going to somewhat depend. Some, you know, look, some states are going to have very specific requirements. For example, in California, you have a Georgia-based PIIA that has a standard non-compete in it because that would potentially invalidate the whole agreement because that provision violates California law. And so some states will have different forms uh, per state and some will say, okay, these are the weird quirky states. We'll have separate ones for those. But otherwise we have kind of form uh, agreement that we put in place. Got it. Well, that seems to be all the questions for now. I appreciate both of you really trying to get through those very specific questions. I, I had a feeling they might be a little bit specific, but um, appreciate both of your time. And thank you to the whole Goodwin team for this wonderful series. It's been really helpful for our community and um, we hope to stay in touch with you all. And for all the attendees, keep an eye out for an email that'll include all the recordings and some really helpful resources for your startup going forward. Thank you both. We'll see you soon.